I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fangs, claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they can be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. <laughs> no, Buster Scruggs was a very good, uh, a very good movie. I like the last one. I think the best. Yeah, Purgatory. Yeah, that was a pretty good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Liam Neeson did throw a cripple off a bridge. Yeah, <laughs> that did it happen. Took me like three seconds to realize what actually happened, and then I went, "Oh no!" It was uh, it was dark. Yeah. It was yeah, dark. I mean, the whole thing with, uh, I mean, the the chicken at least got work done. <laughs> oh, at you're the a end bad of the person. day, I am a bad person. Yeah. But the chicken, <laughs> the chicken got shit done. All right. The chicken got shit. The chicken didn't memorize all them speeches, though. You're not wrong, but the chicken brought in a crowd. The chicken did bring in a crowd. The, and... Uh, yeah. And Liam Neeson didn't have to hold the chicken's penis. Liam Neeson didn't have to hold the chicken's penis. But Liam Neeson didn't have to throw the guy with no arms or legs off a bridge. I think he did. I think that was the only option. Oh, man. The first um, one got me. The Buster Scruggs one. Oh, I thought it was going to be a whole thing about him. I did, too. I didn't realize it was an anthology. But after the first ten minutes, I was like, holy shit. It was so. It was just straight good. I'm I'm looking at the the list of the names. Near Algenades, Algenodes. Uh, th- they were all extremely um. Dark. They were, and the first one when he was playing the guitar in the canyon, and then at the end when he was singing the backup vocals for the guy that shot him. Mm-hmm. That meant that the voices you heard singing in the canyon were all the other mm-hmm. people that he killed. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Like, they're all somewhat connected, the the, the stories. And it, ah, it was just good. The, um... It turns out the... Uh, uh... What was I gonna say? Um, the Gold Prospector one was based off of a short story by Jack London. Oh, really? Yep. That was another good one. They were all good. Mr. Pocket? Mr. Pocket. Mr. Pocket. Yeah. I liked uh, the uh, the girl who got rattled. That one was, like, deeply upsetting. Oh, with the doggo? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, mean, she, 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 she listened well. Like but she a little too the, well. Yeah, exactly. Like, if she had just waited a heartbeat. Just, like, a second. Yeah. Yeah, man. I'm happy to say that I officially have every starter in Let's Go. Nice. And in Abra. And Game Corner. You can't do anything at the Game Corner. How do you get a Porygon now? Uh, It's a rare on Route 7. A rare on Route 7. Okay. So you have to do, like, a catch chain, and then it shows up. Gotcha. All right. I'll have to try Spoiler. to work on that. Oh, uh, retroactive spoiler for the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think, I think we've kind of uh, fucked that one up. Yeah, yeah, that that concludes our Scruggs minute. If you don't know what we're talking about, the Coen Brothers recorded a movie just for Netflix, and it's fantastic because it's a Coen Brothers movie. A guy gets shot to death with a table. There's a boy that gets thrown into a river. There's a mm-hmm. dog. There's an old guy that beats someone to death with a uh, like a mining tool or some shit. It's good. He yeah. After getting shot in the back like six times, like he gets shot in the back, but it goes clean through. Yeah, he was a good guy. He put the the bird's egg back in the nest. He was like when it was, it was eyeballing him when he was trying to get some food. He went, oh, okay. Well, you maybe you just won't miss one. It was good. Ha- how much can a bird count to? Also, that was Tom Waits. <laughs> was that Tom Waits? That was Tom Waits, by the way. Oh, man. 
Um, let's see who else made an appearance. Liam Neeson, Zoe Kazan, Tom Liam Waits. Neeson's. Oh, um, James Franco. That was James another Franco. fun one when he got hanged, and uh, he was like, "Oh, first time, huh?" That was a good one. It was James Franco's bad day, as Alyssa said. There was the uh, that was a great one because the the uh, the banker used the player unknown's battleground defense method, which was fantastic. <laughs> Pan shot. <laughs> He's covered in in freaking pottery. And James Franco was like that banker. He doesn't play fair. <laughs> Pan shot. <laughs> oh. That's oh, just boy. a good movie. Uh, I'm just because because the cats. I had to re I had to re like could jigger my um my audio recording. Gotcha. So yeah. Anyhow, we're good. I've been having the cat struggles. They knocked over my stand. That the uh, I've got my mic and my uh, filters and all that stuff on it. They knocked uh, it over because I had my in ear monitors hanging from it, and they decided I bet I could reach those if I jumped. And they turns out they could. Yeah, they totally could. They, they Cats can reach over. a lot of things if they set their mind to it. Yeah, so I've got the uh, the heavy stand, and I've got it Velcroed to the desk now, in addition to having the heavy-duty legs and all that out, because um, it's expensive stuff. Shit gets expensive. You can't just have cats pulling it all down all the time. You also don't want the cats to accidentally break your capsule. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That would be, that would be uh, pretty bad. Well, the capsule, the monitors, the filters... Yep. Yeah, they ca- I don't care if they chew through the cables. They chew through cables. They're cats. That's what they do. I think all cats have pica. There's another grand generalization. All cats have pica. I mean, I'm not gonna call you on that one because that's that's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> like, cats are assholes. Cats. Yeah, that's it. Just cats are. They're first of all, my two little fur demons. It's winter time. They're still mm-hmm. shedding. I'm still finding fur balls. I don't know what's going on, man. You'll never stop finding fur balls. There's a fact. It's not good. It's not good. I don't step in them, so I'm lucky. But I'm like, it's it's 28 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, they're they're just they're still shedding. I don't know what's going on. They're assholes. Yeah, they're assholes. That's, that's literally it. Yeah, that that's it. 28, I'm making a guess, is minus 1 uh, C for you metric people. Base 10 users, you dirty base 10 users. I only say that because I'm jealous. Should we start? I don't know. Uh, it's negative 2.22. Ah, I was off by 1.22 degrees. Yeah. Well, it's 2.2 repeating, of course. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess we can start. I don't know. Okay, we can when just we... keep on rambling. I've only got like ten pages or something. So... <laughs> well, no, we can start. I'm no, I'm joking. Oh, okay. Yeah. So welcome to the Expedition Zone, the survival reality quiz show, where each week your hosts answer increasingly difficult questions about Terrace House. The only catch is that no speaking is allowed. The loser must survive thirty days naked and afraid style in our human-made tropical paradise while the winner releases specimens from our lab cabin in the woods style if the loser survives they get a platinum level employee badge which will grant them access to the cages in which we keep our rarest beasts that require special containment procedures i'm brandon (laughs) oh no oh no (laughs) oh what? Is that a threat? I'm not losing this one. Yes? Oh, shit. Oh, shit. I already lost. He says, I'm John Dunham. You're, go- <laughs> You're going to the island. Oh. I'm going to use the mermaid. <laughs> oh, I'll just stand in the middle and watch them, you know, watch them suffocate while they beach themselves on the shore. Hey, that didn't stop the that one guy from getting killed by a mermaid in uh, Cabin in the Woods. Cabin in the Woods spoiler, but quite frankly, that's like a decade old movie now. So if you haven't watched it, that's on you. Yeah, yeah, totally. Our creature this week was first discovered in 1891. It resides in the Scottish Highlands. It is rarely seen today, and in appearance, it is a giant humanoid. 
Do you have any guesses on what it could be? Mm, it's probably not a banshee. Um, giant humanoid is like. like it likes being on hills. If is that it a helps hill giant all. of some kind, or it is? It is not a hill giant, but I'll give you a half point because that's okay. that's pretty pretty damn close. Uh, hill cyclops. <laughs> hill no. ogre. No, no, no. Shrek. No. Two eyes. It has two eyes. Is it Shrek? It is not. So, our cryptid this week is the Amphir Lieth Moor, which... There would, have, there would have been literally no way I could have gotten that. Yeah, no, I know. That, that That's almost... That's <laughs> basically why I chose it. God damn it. it that's so hyper-specific. <laughs> Uh, okay, so so I've never heard about this, so let's uh k- take me through it a little bit. I will after I figure out how to send messages again every week. I forget. There you go. Wow, that's that's a name. That is a name. Shadow of the Shadow Lossus. The Amphir Lyth Moor is described as an extremely tall, giant-like humanoid creature covered in short hair. It is said to roam around the highest peak of the fog-covered Cairngorms, and its presence is often given away by the sounds of footsteps distant on the mountaintop. Think exactly like Colossi from Shadow of the Colossus. So should I start catching uh, lizards with white tails and eating their tails so I can hold on better? Yes. Yeah, no, no. Ex- yeah, definitely. That's that's right. That's a good idea. I'm going to go away for this episode because I got some work to do. Okay. <laughs> I've been really lax on my uh, white tail eating. Oh, man. You got to get them white tails. The Amphir Lythmore, literally translated to Big Gray Man. Roams... That's a clever name. It is. It is. It's they... a very clever name. <laughs> uh, I, the, um, let's see. What else? Uh, Thunderbird could be renamed. Big Bird in the Sky. Um, Moth Dover Man's Demon a creative is, one, yeah. <laughs> Dover Demon's now a white little monster. Um, <laughs> Loch Ness is, man, that's a big fish. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, Yeti is bear. Sheep Squatch um, is Danny DeVito. Yeah, that's, well, <laughs> tall Danny DeVito. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see, Skunk Ape. Well, Skunk Ape's already there, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the big gray man roams Ben McDewey, what happens to be the second highest peak of Scotland and the British Isles. Its peak over one thousand three hundred and nine meters or four thousand two hundred and ninety five feet above sea level and above the tree line. Its summit is covered in rounded wind swept stones. Mm, it's a big okay. tall creepy just a cool it sounds like somewhere you'd find in Skyrim almost. It does. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. One of its first encounters was recorded by James Norman Cauley, scientist, mountaineer, and professor of organic biology at the University College of London. Cauley took the first x-ray photograph. He created the first neon lamp along with Sir William Ramsey. Seen in 1891, it wasn't until 1925, 34 years later, that at Cangorm Club, he first disclosed his encounter okay yeah so boys got chops wait but why did he wait 34 years to disclose his encounter with the big beast were there other encounters reported in the Enderman? that i so i don't know why he waited that long i didn't check when the cairngorm club meeting started but it may have been the much later that he was actually in a mountaineering club or he could have disclosed this, or it could just be that he was um, so, sort of embarrassed or, or worried what would happen because he is a professional if he mm-hmm. disclosed saying, I saw a giant, or it could be that he's full of shit. I usually like to go with the full of shit angle, but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt this time. Yeah, it, it in this case, actually for all the sightings, I don't want. I don't want to. Uh, no spoilers. I'll avoid any spoilers. But J. Norman Cauley said at the meeting, "I was returning from the cairn on the summit, 
in a mist when I began to think I heard something else merely than the noise of my own footsteps. Every few steps I took, I heard a crunch, and then another crunch, as if someone was walking after me, but after taking steps three or four times the length of my own. I said to myself, this is all nonsense. I listened and heard it again, but could see nothing in the mist. As I walked on and the eerie crunch crunch sound behind me, I was seized by terror and took to my heels, staggering blindly among the boulders four or five miles, nearly down the Rothy Murchis forest. Got it in one. Got it in one, boy. Whatever you make of it, I do not know. But there is something very queer about the top of Ben McDewey, and I will not go back there myself, I know. So, wait a second. He encountered it, but he didn't see it. Exactly, yeah. So, this one, there's no description, but he set the scene. It's a misty, tree-free summit. That's well above the tree line, right? He had to run four or five miles to get down to the trees. Um, And he is what you would think would be a typically skeptical person. But he succumbed to his his basic instincts and just sort of ran for his life. And it's the first instance of footsteps. Go on. So are we sure that this isn't just mountain madness? What's mountain Um, madness? I don't know. Just mountain madness. You know what I mean. You you go up on a mountain... You get mad. You go crazy. Also, I want to point out. I'm looking at Google, Google Earth. One, I for I forgot how high, like in terms of parallels, uh, the UK is. Oh yeah, man, it's up there. Um. Second, uh, I'm pretty sure my house is at a higher ev- elevation than this mountain. Like I'm looking at the. I'm looking at the topographical map right now, and then I looked over where my house is. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I guess, to me, means uh, the UK is a low low country in terms of... Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's low for their mountains to be that, that tall. Yeah. They're, they're kind of like our, uh, our Midwest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. So, anywho. It would, however, be remiss to not note that Kali while having one foot in the world of science, also had his other foot in the occult mysticism and lore. Kali Mm. has been described as being uh, believing emphatically in Nessie. He approached the beast, Alistair Crowley, for membership to one of his clubs, and was described by his very own biographer as a lifelong believer in the occult. Maybe not the best person to uh, go to for when you hear something in the woods. Oh, yeah. He he seems very, I don't want to say divided, but he was definitely living in two different worlds. I mean, it was the, the 1900s. Everyone was living in two different worlds at that time. That's true. Science and magic no one, were sort of close yeah, then. No one knew what they were doing. This just does not bode well for his overall um, credibility. It lowers his credibility rating, definitely. Yeah. I mean, also the fact that he didn't see anything but heard something. I mean... I remember someone telling me the story once when they were younger, they would hear yeah. footsteps coming up the stairs. They thought uh-huh. it was footsteps, but it's really just the, uh, the artery in their head. You know, the oh, one that, that yeah, like if you yeah, lay yeah. on your head in a weird way, you can hear it. Yeah. They, they misattributed the, their own blood to footsteps. And <laughs> I know, I know that he's a mountaineer, but that doesn't mean that he can't misattribute something as well. Oh yeah. Well, especially if you're out there alone, it's f- foggy. Who knows? I don't got remember the mountain how long madness. he was out there. And you get the mountain madness. You've got the mountain madness. Don't forget the mountain madness. Yeah. In an earlier incident, this time by biologist Hugh Welsh and his brother in 1904, and by earlier, I mean it was... They Before... saw it earlier than he announced it to the club. Okay, so then the the question I had earlier... Uh, asked and answered, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Welsh was on a camping trip near the summit of Ben McDewey when they heard the slurring of footsteps as if someone was walking through water-saturated gravel. He also reported being frequently conscious of something near us, an eerie sensation of apprehension, but not fear as others seem to have experienced. What? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I I like his description, though, the, the slurry wet gravel. 
Like they're these guys are good at scene setting, if nothing that is, else. That is very visceral. Yeah. I will say. Oh yeah, totally. And when they brought this up to the head stalker at Derry Lodge, the man, also the man with the coolest title, period, the head stalker. Is that a cool title though? That's a pretty cool title. I want to be the head stalker at work. All right. I'm going to give you a chance to consider what you just said. But like if modern... stalker, like if stalker didn't mean stalking, I'd want to be the head stalker. Okay, that's fair, but words mean things. I guess. <laughs> I guess. So when they brought this up to the head stalker, the man said to them that uh, that would have been the fear life more you heard. So he just knew that that was a thing. He just knew that it was a thing. So it, there's no sightings, but it seems like at this point, uh, it's happening frequently enough and people are starting to mention it enough that for at least the last 13 years at that point in time, the local woodsmen have been aware of it and are just chalking up people's strange experiences to having been the Am Fear Life more. So here's my question. Yes? Here's my question. Question on. Is there an, is there an old man Jenkins in the story? Because this is starting to smell, sound an awful lot like a Scooby-Doo <laughs> mystery. There's, it would be super cool if there was an old man Jenkins. I think the actual description is maybe cooler than the creature itself in this one. But uh, it would okay. be pretty dope if there was just a guy hiding at the peak behind some rocks making f- footsteps and shit. He's, he's scaring people away from the mountain gold. There's mountain gold at the top of that mountain. I don't think there's that much quartz up there. There's there's gold up on top of that mountain. Oh, I'm I guess. telling you. I'm telling you. <laughs> there's gold, or he hid it up there after performing some act of uh, robbery, but couldn't retrieve it. So now he's trying to find it, <laughs> and he has to scare people away from the mountaintop so he can find the gold. I have been watching... An unholy <laughs> amount of Scooby Doo during my time off. <laughs> How much Scooby have you been watching? I may have finished a season and a half of Be Cool Scooby Doo. Oh man! So, Do they still have the same voice actors? Uh, except for Shaggy. Gotcha. For obvious reasons. Oh yeah, you told me right. He what? What was it that he ate? Meat, but uh, he used to eat like tofu. But the problem yeah. is. The problem with Shaggy is Casey Casey died. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that's that. that's yeah, that's that's oh. why Shaggy's now voiced by like the live action movie guy. Yeah, I think. Okay, so yeah, that's cool. I mean, I'm happy that they they're doing the live action movie thing. I wish they would have kept him a vegetarian for for Casey Kasem's sake because it seemed like that was a big part of Shaggy for Casey. Yeah, I wish they would have kept it too, but you know. yeah. It's definitely not in Be Cool Scooby-Doo. Oh, man. Okay. The next encounter, and one of the first written visual encounters, was in 1958. With That's the... a long gap. That is a pretty... Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a gap. It was seen by a mountaineer and naturalist, Alexander Tunian, who accounts, In October 1943, I spent a day... Sorry, I spent a 10-day leave climbing alone in the Cairngorms. One afternoon, just as I reached the summit of Cairn Ben McDewey, mist swirled across the... <laughs> oh, sh- oh, man. You, Guys, you did this to yourself. Yeah, if you want, just bet... Just $2, you can read our scripts and see what we're dealing with, because it's worth it. Guys, especially... All right, here we go. Mist swirled across Larig Garu okay. and enveloped the mountain. The atmosphere became dark and oppressive. A fierce, bitter wind whisked among the boulders, and an odd sound echoed through the mist. A loud footstep, it seemed, then another and another. A strange shape loomed up, receded, and came charging at me. Without hesitation, I whipped out the revolver and fired three times at the figure. When it came... (laughs) When it still came on, I turned and hared down the path, reaching Glen Derry, in time that I think I've never bettered. You may ask, was it really the fair Laith Moore? Frankly, I think it was. Okay, so, one, 
did any of those those revolver shots hit? Because if this was like the Enfield horror guy, you know, he would have known. Apparently, two. <laughs> how big is this creature? Because like I- I'm hearing a lot of descriptions of like a giant thing. Yeah. But I think we need to know how big it was because at a certain point, the size of a creature does matter. Yeah. Okay. So it's approximately three times the height of a well, like a normal size human. Okay. So if you imagine you standing on your shoulder twice. All right. But so you're alone that's... in the mist. That's for me. Oh. Okay. Uh, I, there's like a 20, part of me that's twenty feet tall. What is it? The the cube square law or whatever. Yeah. I, I'm starting to get a little bit suspicious of this. Are you? It's it's like a twenty foot tall humanoid that and and it's it mm-hmm. doesn't matter whether his bullets hit or not, which we'll get into later, which is very interesting. Okay. Let's uh-huh. let's get let's keep moving then. Okay, I'm very proud to have written this because I was bored. Ready? Go for it. Now we have our first sighting, albeit without a good description, but whatever our manly mountaineering madman saw, it was malicious enough for our misanthropic matriarch to maintain a steady hand and fire upon our meandering mountainous monster. (laughs) Ah, yes. Why did you do this? I, Why? I... <laughs> Why'd you Peter Piper pick to pickle pepper pear me on this? I thought it would be fun to see how many M's I could fit into a, a, a run-on sentence. Yeah, I mean, it is definitely a run-on sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, parts of it don't make sense either. But no, you did it. I was going for the M's. I was going for the M's, man. Uh, We've got a trigger happy mountaineer shooting at the thing and it still comes at him. And we I have the same it... thing where it inspires fear and he just everyone just runs as fast as they can. Just like Mbop. Just like Mbop? Mbop. Mbop? Hansen? What's that? You've never heard Mbop by Hansen? I don't know if I've heard a Hansen song. You know what? I'm gonna let you keep that 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 life. <laughs> it's it's not a good life to listen to to Hanson. I won't expose you to it. No, okay. Yeah. I think I have a Hanson CD somewhere in my house. So oh man, that's terrible. Shoot, there's a uh, there are some things that I've never heard, and I'm I'm perfectly fine having never heard them. Hanson being one of them. One of the more recent accounts comes from a report to Mark Fraser in 1994. This account takes 20 miles away at Castle Dunodald, constructed in 1371 for Robert II, nephew of Robert the Bruce, whom you may recognize from episode one, Redcaps. So we've got a nice little callback right in here. All right, then. Yeah, man. Mark, in this case, was out looking for a creature that was said to have roamed the castle grounds. It was said that the dogs around Dunodald Castle would become restless, looking towards the hill, barking and yelping. He reports that one man told him, while walking along the hill, he heard whispering voices behind him. When he turned, there was nothing there. This happened several times before he went to seek refuge at a local bar. Okay, that seems perfectly normal to me. Yep, totally normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, man. Another man reported to him, that he saw two shadows following him. Then, they merged together and became twice the size. This was the last thing the man saw, as he fled not to be around for what happened next. All right, Shaggy. <laughs> it is very Scooby-Doo-ish, this whole, this, uh, this, this whole this deal. Whole, this whole ordeal literally reads like a Scooby-Doo episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, every encounter with this is like something that would happen in Scooby-Doo. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm waiting for someone to make a sandwich so big that they can't <laughs> physically eat it, but then that then cryptid like in itself they unhinge their jaw and compress yeah. the sandwich just enough that they may consume it in one bite while remaining eternally skinny. <laughs> I'm waiting for someone to get so scared. They run, their feet are going, but they're standing in place, and then all of a sudden they get traction and zoom, shoot off. Well, you see, that's that. That's just, you know, you pre-run, 
It's like when you take a bicycle wheel, yeah. right, and you elevate it a little bit on the tracks <laughs> before you're about to do a, a sick jump. Uh-huh. You're just you're just building up the energy, the momentum. That's all. Yeah, yeah. No big deal. <laughs> One woman named Josephine Aldridge stated that she would never return to the castle for the rest of her life. She decided to visit the castle on a day out, and all of a sudden her two dogs began running in circles growling and snapping before slinking backwards with their tails between their legs. She describes seeing this huge creature in the distance ahead of her, and adding that it did not uh, not appear to be solid and was covered in charcoal-colored hair. Apparently, she investigated and noticed that it made no impressions upon the grass. She added that the most terrifying thing about the creature were its slit-like glowing red eyes. She began to pray, and after a while, the creature apparently faded away. There's a lot... Okay. There's a lot. There's a lot of confusing, almost contradictory things in this statement. Yeah. Um, One... So... Okay, okay. There's a lot to this. There's a lot to unpack. So... I will, I will, so I'll let you unpack, but I'll let you know that this one, of everything we've covered so far, because we know what the Amphirlaith Moor is, is the most accurate description, and almost all, not all, but almost all the details described are correct. Really? Yeah. So what was your unpacking? I should have I should have waited until after you unpacked, but what was your unpacking? Well, well, I just, so there's a few things to this. One charcoal cover hair solid like is it it almost sounds like just a an angry scotsman <laughs> who, do, who like an angry atheistic scotsman he heard the prayers and he's like ah no 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 i don't want to deal with this <laughs> but he's, he's also really he's light he's, he's the light scottish wizard from the uh jerry duggan and uh brian possein deadpool comics <laughs> mm, mm-hmm <laughs> Just an angry Scottish wizard. About. Yeah, I, I think it's an angry Scottish wizard. The glowing red eyes. He's he likes to wear rose colored glasses, and then he's got like a headlamp on. I don't know. Uh-huh. <laughs> he's just a weird dude. Oh uh-huh. wait, Scooby Doo monster. Scooby-Doo. Someone was getting close to the has- castle. Yeah, he had hidden treasure in that castle. He didn't want them around it. Scared them away for their life. Is there? It's been a while since I've seen some Scooby Doo. Uh, my favorite, by the way, was the Harlem Globetrotter episodes. But is there are there any episodes where it's not hidden treasure? Yeah, there are. Okay. Um, the most recent episode I watched, there was an abominable snowman that was scaring people away from the house. Yeah. Uh, uh the the not house the like s- ski resort because they they were like a professional snowboarder. Oh. And they didn't want they didn't want people coming to their mountain. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, it's not all hidden treasure. Mm-hmm. Like the one time there was a murder. Oh, that didn't happen. Oh, I was thinking of Detective Conan. Oh man, did you see the? De- oh, all right, if no one has seen the Detective Pikachu trailer, they should go watch it because it is the singular most terrifying thing I've ever seen. I'm it's- so excited to see that movie. It's like air quotes realistic pikachu voiced by ryan reynolds and pokemon are real and it's the oh man it's if, it's something keep an eye on the trailer though because there's three emolga in the scene where they're like in the uh area where all the food cars are or whatever the food tents yeah there's three emolga on top of one of the food tents and they're like they're plotting something oh, <laughs> they're oh, the man. true villains of the movie i'm telling you right now shoot uh, Mr. Mime. <laughs> it's a nightmare creature. <laughs> and I... <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> for, so I was... for those listening, he just karate chopped his own microphone. <laughs> I did, while trying to mimic Mr. Mime. <laughs> My levels are fucked. <laughs> oh, man. At this point, we finally have some descriptions of the creature. And I would also like to note... That Mark Fraser thinks it is a man ape. So Mark is pretty far off. 
All right. I feel like you already know what the creature is, and you're just leading me on now. I know what it is. But at this point, to sum up sort of the details, it's extremely tall. It's covered in hair. It moves silent, silently with the exception of when it moves on stones. And it seems to only appear when it is foggy or misty, and it is not fully corporeal. So the fog has something definitely to do with it, then. The, the fog is the key. Okay. The fog it. is the key to this whole whole this whole thing, man. It's all in the fog, and it's uh, all connected. It's all connected. It's all connected. Oh man. Oh. Oh shit. Ah. There. I don't know what it could have been this time. It's you're 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 exposing their Scooby Doo like plot to keep people away from that castle. <laughs> There, that means there is something at the castle. And there Manfred is. knows they want to keep us away from the castle. There's an actual monster in the castle. There is, and it's not Jiro. No. Well, no, you see, the thing is, they're, they're trying to keep people away from an actual monster by making a fake monster, because that makes total sense. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Red Smock. Every day, family, friends, and strangers get together to share a meal. But not every meal is homemade, let alone home butchered. Red Smock is a monthly mystery box. Each delivery, you will receive curated home butchery supplies specially designed for our listeners. Featuring some products from past sponsors we all know and trust, like Calcigon, Hemoy, and Vague Loves. Red Smock and our owner, JD, guarantee that from now on, you'll make meals to die for. So, use promo code CRYPTOPEDIA at checkout and ask yourself, who should I have for dinner today? Yeah, man, this thing is basically exactly a Shadow of the Colossus creature. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, I'm looking at the... You got a Shadow of the Colossus, the first Colossi in here. Yeah! Um, And it's pretty cool. Yeah, man. I remember that game. It's a fun game. It's a fun ass game. The um I think my favorite fight is the one where you have to like climb on top of the flying one. Yeah. That's the best one. All right. Just, on. just in general, it's a fun yeah. fight. And there's the one that's like not really a Colossus, but it's more like a bull. That one yeah. kinda sucked. Oh, that was a fun one to watch. It's a fun one to watch, but it's like it's not as epic as the other ones because basically the entirety of that fight is literally just climbing up pillars. Yeah. So, eh. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're back at uh, we're back with the the Scooby Doo fan cast, Cryptopedia. Yeah. Uh, where one person talks about Scooby Doo for the entirety of the episode because everything reminds him of Scooby Doo. <laughs> when the world's a hammer. Everything's wow. a Scooby. When the world's a, a hammer, everything's a Scooby. <laughs> everything. So, the explanation of the Amphir life more is just as cool as the creature itself. In 1791, Scottish poet James Hogg was out taking care of his sheep when he encountered the Grey Man. He mm. recounts, It was a giant blackamoor, at least 30 feet tall and equally proportioned. It was very near me, and I was actually struck powerless with astonishment and terror. Uh, <laughs> I see what it is now. Yeah. Okay. However, James returned the next day, and so did his giant. This time, James decided to experiment. He removed his hat and made other gestures. He observed that the giant specter did the same thing as he did. James left content what he was actually seeing was his own shadow that's amazing right oh that's so good it's so good and you can see how it just it would be terrifying if you're not expecting it that would be a nightmare yeah it's like it's like when you're walking and you see a reflection in like a window or something and it catches yeah. you off guard oh yeah well i scare myself with the painting of myself in my house all the time i'll walk past and think there's someone standing there to be fair, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is a giant painting of yourself. Yeah. yeah. almost It's almost life-size that I've got it hung so that our eyes meet. So it's also like the same height as me. 
I mean, it's a phenomenal painting, but I can definitely see how in low light <laughs> it would uh, be problematic. Oh, yeah. Or if I'm mowing the lawn and I look at it through the window, if it catches it, I'm like, who's in my living room? He just is staring into space. Just staring. Wishing, wishing he could drink all that scotch underneath him. Oh, yeah, man. It's a good collection. I've got some bourbon in there because for Thanksgiving, I made a really nice cherry bourbon sauce. I Ooh. reduced it with some red wine vinegar and mm-hmm. uh, and bourbon. I used Elijah Craig uh, mm-hmm. bourbon and uh, some cherry. It's good. It's pretty good that stuff. Sounds good. Bourbon sauce is pretty phenomenal. Yeah. I will say. Oh, yeah. What James saw, and very likely many others also saw, is what is called a broken specter, sometimes called a mountain specter. A broken specter is the magnified shadow of the observer cast upon the clouds opposite the sun's direction. So they were seeing their own shadows cast upon the mist around them at the top of the mountains. That's amazing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's a If you scroll down uh, the next paragraph, there's a picture of a broken specter and if you just saw that while you were out that would that would be pretty terrifying it would be extremely terrifying oh yeah oh yeah which is also why if if he shot it it doesn't matter if he moved towards it it would look like it was running towards him well you see here's the problem he shoots at it it shoots at him it shoots shadow bullets (laughs) then he gets shot with a shadow bullet now he's dead that's the worst kind of bullet it's the worst kind of bullet, because then that takes you to the Shadow Realm, and you have to battle UD. <laughs> and he's going to cheat. He's going to cheat at cards. You know, if any of them were even, like, a little bit good at sleight of hand, they would have been so much better. I feel like that was an episode, like, there's like, at least seven episodes about sleight of hand. Really? With, like, and card control cheating. and, like, culling yeah. stuff to the top and keeping your stock? Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah, there's like at least seven episodes of people cheating and still losing to Yugi because he, he cheats better. Well, isn't Yugi, it's been a while since I saw the show, isn't Yugi like a millennia old uh, pharaoh? Well, that's Yami. Oh, oh, I gotcha, I gotcha, I gotcha. Oh, it's all coming back to me. There's Yugi, there's Yami. They share the same vessel. Yeah! All right, I got it. Everyone with a millennium item basically can transform into a, dar- a shadow version of themselves yeah yeah yeah. i got gotcha, you i got gotcha, you i got gotcha. you okay yeah so this phenomena can appear on any misty mountainside or cloud bank and can be seen from an airplane but the frequent fogs and low altitude accessibility of the broken peak i read that so wrong you s- so wrong yeah man so wrong so wrong uh blah 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 airplanes whatever you get the idea you see it when it's foggy and when you're up high yeah the hans mountains in germany uh have created a local legend from which the phenomena draws its name the broken specter was observed and described by member of the prussian academy of sciences and johan johan i pick the ones with all the bad words you really do silberschlag in 1780. Right. Yeah, I think it got pretty close on that one. I think you actually got real close on that one. Yeah. And has since been recorded often in literature about the region. It is also worth noting that if you'd like, and on a foggy day, you can recreate a broken specter with your car's headlights. So, here's my question. Yes. What's the likelihood that, like, Yeti and Bigfoot sightings are broken specters? Because oh, I feel like shit. it's pretty high. I never even reason. thought about that. Because then like, you have fog or just like light snow with the yeah. sun uh, on your back. It's entirely possible. I didn't even think about that. You just blew my own mind. Because I've been thinking about, I've been reading a lot about the Yeti lately. Because yeah. I'm reading a book about skepticism and cryptozoology. Um, and they're currently going into the Yeti. And most most likely the Yeti is a brown bear. Himalayan, okay. Himalayan brown bear, like the the tracks and all that stuff. And yeah, it, it there's a whole episode about that. Um, but for the sightings where someone sees like a humanoid walking for a, a lar- like a long period of time on a far oh, yeah. hilltop, especially in the morning if they're by a lake yeah. or a river, when you have all of that steam, you ever see all that come yeah. right off the top? That's I never even thought about that. Yeah, there's definitely. I, mean, I would say it's probable now that there are at least some sightings of Bigfoot or Yeti that are our potential broken specters 
Yeah, not every sighting, but not you all know, of them, but let's, maybe a few. Yeah, a few could possibly be broken specters. Oh yeah, I, I only I only say that because the picture you have here is literally it literally looks like a yeti standing on a, a hilltop. Yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't even think about that. That's uh, totally worth keeping in the back of our heads as we go forward, and, and if when we get around to doing some of the uh, humanoid Bigfoot type stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Brian Dunning of Skeptoid comments on the sounds heard in our first two stories. As fog thickens and thins, temperatures fluctuate, rocks expand and contract and split. Ice also splits rocks. When either of these happen on a slope, a rock may tumble. These actions are, in fact, entirely responsible for the crumbled stone of which Ben McDewey consists. Even on a calm day, rocks make such noises everywhere. I can attest to that, having hiked and climbed rocks in this region. Yeah? That's pretty yeah. cool. Uh, if you go to, whatchamacallit, Mount Mohonk and you do the rock scramble, you'll hear rocks falling oh, yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. All the time. All the time. The scramble and the lemon squeeze? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The lemon squeeze is really not that bad. I don't know why people no. say it's that bad. Well, but I then again, it... It's marketing. If they say it's bad, it gets you to show up. But if it's really that bad, they have insurance problems. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Also, I credit you for not trying to read that in Brian Dunning's voice. It was a struggle. The You're struggle learning. was real. It was in my... You know how when you read, there's that voice in your head? It was uh-huh. his voice in my head, but my voice coming out of my mouth. And I did that Good. for you. Thank you. Brian continues, Hikers disturb nearby creatures, and hiking anywhere will always produce the sounds of some scattering animal. There's no doubt that these sources of sound account for at least some of the noises reported by Gray Man witnesses. That is okay. the best explanation I have seen for the Gray Man and what may have been the best explanation so far for any cryptid of research, because that's hands down, it's it's their shadows being projected into the fog mm-hmm. and the woman who saw on grass heard nothing but saw no footsteps. And the people who saw it on Ben McDewey heard the rocks around them moving mm-hmm. and saw it. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think that, like, fully accounts for for at least most of the sightings that we've read so far. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. yeah. The only thing that's weird is the red eyes, but she might have just been... I think like, that's an addition. I think she might have been like, oh, it's so menacing. Let me throw some red eyes on there. Yeah. Th- red those eyes? Are firmly, uh, red eyes are a very common motif. They're so common and they make no sense. Yeah. 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 Like. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I was going to say something, but then yeah. I forgot it. Uh, there is, however, an example of one set of footprints found and the photographs were published. I will admit that I did not purchase this book. It was not available on Kindle, and it was not at my local bookstore. However, it may be worth mentioning that I did find excerpts of portions in which I was interested. These were taken by John A. Rennie and appeared in his book, The Romantic Strathspey. He describes them as 19 inches long and 14 inches wide. They were each about 7 feet apart, and there was no discernible difference from the left and the right foot. Uh, Mm. And the steps proceeded in a single line. Fortunately, he saw them again, and this time they appeared before his eyes, apparently caused by precipitation in the area. He continues, In that moment, I knew that the Wendigo, Abominable Snowman, Bodak Moor, or whatever have you, was forever explained so far as I was concerned. So we now have an explanation of how people could see footprints in snow as well. Hmm. Okay. I mean, there's also the, the other easier, less phenomenal way of a bear walk through the forest and bears walk single file through their own footprints. And when two foot feet land, it looks like a human footprint. Yeah, true. That's, that's the other way too. Yeah. Also, when to go, I, I noticed that he has Wendigo in there. He opened with Wendigo, which I thought was yeah. weird. Because I, I, I've I never heard about Wendigo footprints. I hear no. a lot about uh, Yeti and Abominable Snowman footprints. Not really Wendigos. 
No, Wendigos are kind of more or less like a bunch of people murder each other, and then they're, then they're like, yeah, that was the Wendigo. Or yeah. a person <laughs> goes on a murderous rampage. Yeah, that was the Wendigo. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's less it's less a uh, mythical creature that's misunderstood and more uh, abstract concept of a spirit that inhabits the soul of a person after they commit cannibalism and drives yeah. them mad. Oh yeah, he 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 opened with a weird one. Also, Wendigo, uh, good idea for a future episode. Well, actually, anything we haven't covered yet, good idea for a future episode. <laughs> You're not wrong. I mean, that's fair. Yeah. But yeah, it was a weird one. Um, yeah. It's almost upsetting how easily explainable it is. It's very easily explainable. But it's something that would be clearly scary to see. And if you're not frequently out in the mornings or on hilltops when it's misty, you, you'd probably not have seen one. Like, you, you have to have the right conditions and be in the right area. So I wonder if the, what's his name, the head stalker? Yeah. I wonder if he said, yeah, it's the gray man. Oh, by the way, that's a broken specter. <laughs> and then the dude just like left it off. You know, if he, if someone's at a lodge and there's a new guy, new guy shows up and says I heard something, and you know about this thing, thus so you can see your own shadow. I wouldn't put it past them to just say, yeah, it's 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 the it's the big gray man. That's the Amphir Lathmore. I mean, I was listening to an episode of the Dollop recently. Yeah, and uh, it was on ab- Aboriginally Aborigine uh, people. Oh yeah, yeah. Is this the one where the the guy was immune to bullets? Yeah, Polly or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was listening to that, and apparently the Aborigines would yeah. go to uh, like sheep and cows and stuff and say, "That's a kangaroo." <laughs> they know it's not a kangaroo. They're just messing with the people who think they know more than you. Yeah, that was that How, was a fun one. <laughs> I feel like ninety percent of all things like can boil down to someone fucking with someone else. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, that was fantastic. That was a really good episode. I like that. They, they just start calling everything a kangaroo just to annoy everybody. <laughs> it's really good. It's yeah. really good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. What an easy explanation for the gray man. What an easy... It's a, It was a really cool explanation. And one that if you have a car, you can go out, wait till it's foggy. You can try to make one yourself. That is pretty cool. I mean, yeah. at, at its core, that that's science. Yeah. Yeah, so. it's replicatable. Yeah. That's yeah. that's a science experiment right there. Yeah. I, um, yeah. Yeah. I think that wraps everything up. All right. As always, you can access our website at CryptopediaCast.com. On Instagram and Twitter, we're at CryptopediaCast. If you want to email us, CryptopediaCast at gmail.com or us at CryptopediaCast.com. All these links are on our website. We have a Patreon. We've got several tiers there. Uh, I'm currently working on the follow-up to the Ballad of Shank Daddy X that I released on Thanksgiving. Which is so good, right? If any of you haven't seen it and you saw creepy, uh, Creepypedia show up in your feed, just listen to it. Shank Daddy makes George R. R. Martin look like an imposter. And John makes Morgan Freeman look like a poser. The yeah. delivery and the writing is phenomenal. And I'm, I'm legitimately excited for part two. Part one, he read for me after a game of Betrayal, and it, it, I was so excited. I was it's, so excited for it. It's a wild story. Um, it's a crazy story. I wouldn't say it was particularly well articulated by them. No, no. They're, it is it is worth saying that John read it with his bare hands. I guess that's technically correct, because I did use my bare hands to turn the pages on my tablet. <laughs> so, I guess you're technically correct. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's way less bare hands in the, the next episode. Oh, man. Uh, but that's actually going to be released as a $5 and up member uh, Patreon subscription, which is where all of our bonus content will go. Uh, for the most part, right now, my plans for bonus content are things that are not necessarily appropriate for the main feed. And if we ever get ads for the podcast, we'll put uh, ad-free episodes in there. Yep, $2, you get the 
uh, our ad, our, our copies of everything. So you get the full write up. We do a full write up with pictures for each episode. And uh, I think in the future we might be doing some Mountain Monsters Rift Track style, hopefully, which I'm very yeah. excited for. Uh, oh which will be God. awesome for the five dollars. That that'll yeah, be yeah, that'll that, be good. That, that's on our queue. Um, I don't know. Are we gonna even be able to come close to like matching the sheer comedy that is built into Mountain Monsters? It'll probably just be us watching Mountain Monsters, and the track is just us laughing. That's I mean, we can it's... definitely comment on it. Like we've commented it enough in previous episodes about what these guys do. There's one where they built a maze. They were trying to catch a chupacabra. They built a maze out of wood pallets, put normal dogs in there, and just showed it to you using only the thermal cam. So, and, and they're clearly just normal dogs. Yep. And then they clearly open it themselves, but then go, They got out! They got out! They chewed through the cage! It's and then so... it's just a normal dog standing in the distance. It's guys. Ugh. It's so fake. It's it's ridiculous. It's so good. It's so fake though. <laughs> yeah. Um if you want to see grown men shaking clearly shaking their own foot and then saying it's got me by the leg, it's got me by the leg. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I will say if any of them has been able to tie their own shoes in the past decade, I would be amazed. Oh yeah. Um well, tie their own shoes while it's on their foot. Yeah. <laughs> we also have a Facebook group, which if you search Cryptopedia Cast on Facebook, you'll find it. Um, if you like the show, rate it, review it, subscribe, all that good stuff. Share it with your friends. Yeah, share it with your friends. Word of mouth is key. We're not paying for any advertisements right now. Additionally, if you have monster requests or stories or creepy slash cryptid pasta, let us know. Um, if you have any, like, specific requests, always feel free to add that in the message as well. Yeah, man. Yeah, or excited, if, for real, if you got any monster stories or creepypastas, send them in. We said we want to read them, man. We want to read them. And yeah. you can find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com, B-O-Y-E-R in the letter B.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. My Twitter is at crypto brandon, capital C, capital B. Um, and if you want to access me on Instagram, I'm at mu2057. On Twitter, I'm at JF Dunham. My website is johndunhamgames.com, which is probably going to be Cryptopedia forever right now. <laughs> if you want to email me, john at cryptopediacast.com, and all that stuff is on the website underneath our names. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You can find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com. His email is tommikehill at gmail.com. As always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. <laughs>